Sounds good. Hello, how are you? Hi, BJ. How are you? It's been so long. Yeah, indeed. I saw you after a long time, except for I saw you within you know, during the Tadwick conference, but otherwise. <laughs> so nice to have you here. Well, hi, everybody. Adam, yeah, no, we met in the in Tadwick. How are you? And Carlos, I know that he's been very active in Tadwick, but I never had the chance to meet you and, and talk to you. I don't know if you're still there. Or you're <coughs> sort of... I am. I am. I okay. Just... Escaping from the recording. <laughs> <laughs> I should do the same because you you know, I don't know if you noticed my voice. I've been going through a cold over the last few days. So my voice is horrible. So I will need no. some, some help here to finish the hour of talking. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know. Bear with me. <laughs> and Martin or Martin in Spanish. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know you, but hi, <laughs> if you're there. Hi, I am there. It's Martin. Uh, Martin. I'm, I'm quite new to all of this. Uh, that's why I'm mostly trying to listen. And uh, yeah, I kept my camera off because I'm kind of shy. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's perfect. That's perfect. We, we will need some participation, but you can do it without the camera and, and yeah just send the message via chat or or something okay um, and please keep in mind that i'm very new to all of this um yeah but i'm eager to learn that's great that's great to be honest i've been working with this group like for almost two years and i also feel i'm new to everything like when they start talking about ontologies and semantics and all those things i'm like whoa there's a world that i still don't understand I think it's very exciting, though, that we have a number of groups where, quote unquote, new people have jumped into leadership roles, which is really amazing. So and, and I think people in Tadwig are quite happy for that. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, OK, so um, Ming and Wesley are part and obviously Steve are already part of our task group, the Humboldt task group. Um, Wesley has been working with us like, I don't know, for, for a month or so, right? Like <laughs> two weeks out. <laughs> no, what did you say? Sorry. You're, you're muted, but we can understand your, your signs. Sorry, two months, I meant to say. Two months, great, great. And Ming has been, I don't know, she's been with us for a long time and she's been like, great help and testing all the data sets and she's amazing guys so <laughs> if anybody wants to um work with her she's really she's really nice yeah i'm not available thanks <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> no you are okay. great and so and so rob stevenson is also joining he's also part of our group um Basically, we are meeting, we started this, there, there you are, Rob. Um, so now we are a few, I guess maybe some other people will join. I'll try to, I don't know, if people want to introduce themselves, that would be great. Otherwise, we only have an hour, so it might be easier to just like go into the, the topic and then and then we can start conversations in a in a different arena actually if we want we can have an hour and a half i don't know whether th there I, isn't I don't know anything. if my voice will stay with me for an hour and a half but we can try yeah <laughs> it depends on how these discussions go um so basically um we started this um we started this uh, task group i think at the end of 2021 um or i don't remember exactly when to be honest 
Um, and basically the, the idea of this task group was um, to create, um, I would say a vocabulary of terms. So, so terms that would go as an extension of Darwin core or originally it would be its own core that would focus on reporting inventory data. Um, I might start sharing my screen because that's why we have slides. <laughs> are you seeing my slides already? No. Oh, we are, okay, perfect. Sorry. It's not only my voice that it's, <laughs> that it's kind of fussy. Um, um, so we, our interest was to be able to report on some, some key components of inventory data. So surveys uh, that mostly researchers do with a, with a fairly designed protocol, sampling protocol. Uh, but also we wanted to incorporate citizen science data um, and different types of inventories out there. And we started our work based on a paper led by, by Rob Gralnik. Um, actually, let me share the link to these slides because in there, um, yeah, perfect. thank you, Ming. This is what I'm what I'm talking about. You know, she's like always ready. Um, uh, so the the paper by by Rob. Um, sets like the frame for the humbled core. And, and the, he, he describes all the, the terms that would be needed for, um, to report um, the inventory process. And so we based on that, it's a, it's a very interesting paper. So more than welcome to, to read it. Um, we based on that and we started exploring all those terms that he proposed and the framework that, that they proposed. It's um, Rob, Ramona and, and Walter. Um, and basically what, after long conversations within the group, we realized that this could definitely fit the, the Darwin core structure and so that's why we instead of call instead of calling it the humbled core, we decided to call it the humble extension. So I'm just putting it out there because it's very confusing how all the different terms change over time. But basically the framework is called the, the humble core. And since we decided it was not a core by itself, but it was more of an extension of the Darwin core, we decided to call it um, the humble extension. Um, do you want me, are you all familiarized with, like when I refer to inventory data, are you all like familiarized with that type of data or should I go through this um, differences between like presence only data or like incidental records versus inventory or survey? All good, can you, can I, can I see some like thumbs up or down or? Thank you. All good? Great. Um, so basically the focus of our, of our terminology is to, to be able to report on present substance data. So data that has a temporal, um, sorry, has a spatial temporal scope so it's not only a point, but it's more of like an area that has been surveyed or plots within a site and within a, an area of, of um, a sampling area, that it has a taxonomic scope. So we know what we want it to record or to sample. We have an expected list of species, even if it's not properly detailed, the, the expected species list, but we have a taxonomic scope. We know what we are looking for. It's not that we're like incidental records that we are walking and we're just like recording certain species that, we're, that we find attractive or that we uh, have a, 
a special interest. We know we would capture all or as much as we see of certain um, taxonomic group. Um, and then the output would be like a species list. Um, and from the species list, from the detections of the species lists, those would be presences and the species that were not detected. Since we had a taxonomic and a spatial, tem and a spatial temporal scope, we can infer absence. Um, so of course, inferring absences of species is very tricky um, because it depends a lot on, again, the scopes, the methodology that has been, that has been applied and the associated sample effort and completeness of those lists. Um, and that's the kind of information that we are looking to, we are looking for to capture with this extension um, that otherwise would, would be seen as metadata and it's reported in a very unstructured way. And sometimes it's even forgotten to, to be reported on. And that's the key information that we are looking so that the data that we are seeing enables us to infer species absences or not, maybe. The, the, the type of inventory doesn't allow for that. Um, but basically that's, that's, um, that's our, the goal of this, um, of this task group. Any questions, some comments? Wesley, Ming, something to say about about the, the objective? Mm. All good? I think good for now, yes. Perfect. Um, so as I was saying before, we decided to um, create this as an extension of the Darwin core. And that's because we are using the concept of event to link um, all the inventories together. So the way we're thinking of this is that of any hierarchical organization that our inventories have. So, um, I don't know, traps, traps within, within plots, within sites, within an, a whole sample area, those are considered events. Um, and because the, the, and this is the, the sorry, the, the concept behind that event, which is like an action that occurs at some location during some time. And so that, that enables us to describe this sort of like hierarchies within inventories as different events. And so this is just a figure, I don't know, if you've been to the Tad Week session, the Tad Week conference, you've seen these slides in, this is just a, a visual representation of what those events may look like. So some of them may be like a one-to-one -one relationship with an occurrence. So starting like on the lower side of this, of this slide, it's just a one-to-one -one -one relation. So we, you have one event and one presence, oh, sorry, a one occurrence of a species. And then if we move up, um, you start seeing more complexity. So sometimes one event can have multiple occurrences or one event can have two sub events with their occurrences or in a more complex setting where, I don't know, you have a trap within a plot, within a site, you have multiple um, parent and child events. This is this is one tricky side of, of how we think of our, our, on how to structure the data so that um, the terms in the Humboldt extension make some sort of sense. So this is one of the first challenges that we, that we faced um, during the testing. So feel free to jump in, ask questions or whatever, because we found that this part was a little tricky. And And so, well, this is this is basically just a slide summarizing what I just said. Um, keep in mind that many of us come from the ecology arena. We're field ecologists and we were looking for our field surveys to make sense in a, in a 
in a table where there's a lot of nesting nests and, and sometimes the flat structure of like the typical GBIF data, it's very hard um, to follow for, for complex um, survey designs. So, so this is where most of us come. There's a lot of people in the group um, like Steve that has amazing skills in the standards and knows a lot about Tadwig and, and data models. But most of us come from like the ecology arena. And so our, I don't know, our push was to make better sense of our inventory data. Um, and so what we decided is uh, to focus on developing a humble extension to Darwin Core that provides a minimum information vocabulary. So a minimum set of terms that can report on the inventory process. So methodology, effort, completeness, those are the, the core of, of the Humboldt extension. Um, and so we divided, um, I think there's like around 46 terms that we've developed based on that um, paper by, led by Rolf. And we sort of like get rid of, of some of them, um, revise some others, revise the, revise the descriptions, make sure everything fits the, the Darwin core structure and the Tadwig um, standards protocols. And so we did sort of like divided this, the, all the terms in like six categories. Um, the first category describes the general data set and the identification. So a little bit on the person uh, that was sampling the, the, in the field and, uh, and a little bit on the, on the people who were identifying the, the individuals or, or the species um, collected. So the geospatial scope and habitat, this is um, a little bit describing the targeted area to be sampled and then the real area that was sampled um, with our sampling design. And a little bit on how the, uh, that, that sampling design was structured. So how many sites you had, um, how were they, they're, how if they were nested, how were they nested? Um, yeah, and, and yeah. <clears throat> And then um, some terms regarding um, the habitat scope. So I don't know if you only went to survey wetlands, for instance, or and how was the, the reported weather when you did the sampling. Um, sorry, I'm looking at the oh, perfect the links. Thank you. Um, temporal scope. So we added this event duration. Uh, which is um, we generally use it when when we sample our efforts and the time unit, and then to describe the taxonomic scope, we sort of like separated between what was targeted to survey or to sample and what was excluded from that target. So, for instance, if you are, um, I don't know, if you are using a, 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 a net to capture a certain size of insects or of fishes, you know what it's excluded from your survey. What, what size of, of fishes of or organisms are excluded from your survey. So if you have that information, this is the place to include it. Um, and then terms regarding methodology description, um, the compilation, basically we, we, we describe a compilation of inventories. If it's like not only field data, but it's also like a literature research or museum specimens, or, or if it's like a combination of multiple inventories of different types, that's what we call a, a compilation. If it's a field survey, then it's just an inventory. Um, and here is where we included three terms that would allow to report on the protocol and um, that has been used. So uh, instead of having only one um, 
field that like the Darwin core has, which I think it's called sampling protocol, um, but I'm not that sure. So we divided that into three, protocol names, protocol description, and protocol references. Um, and then if your survey also um, focused on capturing abundance of species, you can use these terms for that. Um, and other things like vegetation cover, um, absence, if you um, took samples um, and if you put it in an institution and have vouchers for that. And then another key area of, the, of this extension is the terms related to completeness and effort. Um, so here, what we did is have a, um, defined a term for the sampling effort protocol, uh, the sampling effort value, and the sampling effort unit. So it would allow some more description on the protocol that you're, um, that you're using. And then in the case of completeness, so th there was a nice discussion in the group. Um, and I know I'm pretty sure Wesley will talk a little bit more about, uh, about that. Um, we in the, the, uh, the, the main idea of the, of, um, the Humboldt core was to infer if the survey was complete. So if you were able to sample all the species that you, that you targeted. And so this refers more to um, your, your inference or your interpretation of how the, the inventory was, how complete the inventory is. And I don't know if you're familiar with eBird, but they have a like a slightly similar concept or in any other data set, if you're thinking of a different type of completeness, it, we can talk about that more and, and we have a section for, for that discussion. So I would welcome your, your input here. Um, I'm looking at you, Wesley, also. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay, so then finally, what we did, well, we, we define this, um, these terms and these categories, we define the, the, um, uh, the descriptions, we define examples, um, and definitions, um, very similar to, to how the Darwin core is, is organized. We developed documentation for that. So here's the link for that documentation. It's very tailored for testing the humble extension. And um, because thanks to the GBIF uh, people that are also part of our group, they develop an, a test IPT. And so if you have any data set, you could go through to that IPT and test the humble extension. The, the terms are already loaded in a test mode. Um, and target. Oh, thank you, Damiano. I'll take a look at that. Um, and uh, so there's a documentation you can access there. And there's a form if you decide to, to use the IPT and test some data set that, that you might have. We really welcome feedback. So we developed a Google form that would be, I don't know, fairly straightforward for you to provide some, some feedback. And so that was how we envisioned the Humboldt extension and what were our thoughts and all of the work that we did within Tadwick to develop this, this extension. But in this part um, is the part that we would like to hear more from you to see if the terms that we've developed make sense for you and for the type of inventories or surveys or type of data that biodiversity data that you have. Um, so basically, and we would like to know how you're reporting your methods, how you're reporting your effort, and how you're thinking or reporting completeness. Um, and and I would really welcome like your 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 feedback and your your ideas here. Um, maybe we can start from with methods. Um, I know so Steve is not here, but but Rob. You did a, uh, Rob Stevenson, 
you did a great effort um, trying to categorize methods uh, in order to develop like a controlled vocabulary for all protocols out there. And we know that it's like a very, a very hard task, but you sort of like started trying, right? Yeah, that's right. It's, it, it's interesting uh, to think about what um, Wes uh, was saying at our last meeting, because he made the comment that uh, the uh, Laboratory of Ornithology has for 10 years been trying to, um, I think the word is harmonize data from different uh, protocols, and that they actually gave up. And I, I, we have to dig more into that to see what that really means. Um, but that's a uh, that's a big a big issue if that's if it's if it's true that it's just too hard it's not worth it so we'll see what what happens there we're we're not sure I I had some basic ideas about how to do it but it's um, I I have to admit I haven't found people who've said they've tried and had great success so I'll I'll just carry on from that in it when oh, I said you're here okay good. yes I am um what we had tried to do is effectively create a flat table that would encompass all of the methods with every method having all the necessary information like one piece of information one column in the database and that is what failed because there are too many subtle or not so subtle differences even in in inventories surveys of birds just it with a relatively small number of methods so what's different with a humble core is is that my impression is that it, it's not trying to create a single field for every possible type of method and description of the method but rather to create generic a more generic vocabulary within which you could then allow different protocols to use the same vocabulary or the same terms for different methods so in other words you would actually need not just to know you you would need to know or you would actually need to parse out effectively every protocol's methods and separate them on the user end but not in the database storage end and what we failed in was try to have all of this information encompassed on the storage and in a way that was easier for for users for end users and that it seems like that we just never found a way to make that work i i can add uh, one other uh tidbit to that and that is i have a colleague at umass boston named uh, jared burns who works on kelp forests and he's tried to compare methods across the globe um and he had an example from marine uh, efforts on the West Coast, where there's a lot of different people doing marine surveys. And there too, they found difficulty um, trying to harmonize data from, from several sources. So it's not what, you, not what you're saying. It's not trying to put all this in, describe all the methods in one database, but the harmonizing step, the next step, they found difficult too. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that's very important to, to, for people to discuss because the the overall goal for conservation is to, uh, and for GBIF is to be able to have those data available and for people to be able to find out what the methods are and try to develop harmonizing protocols to make use of the multitude of, uh, multitude, multitude of uh, survey types. So I, I wonder, how are you, um, if anybody wants to add in the chat or or directly in the slides or just open your microphone, how how are you and in your um, collection systems? How are you tracking the protocols used? Um, as as Wesley was saying, we sort of like defined like these three terms that are somewhat very flexible. For instance, the protocol description, you could put as much information as you want there. But we were wondering if that makes sense um, for the type of inventories that you are carrying out, um, if you have other ideas. 
Well, the, the, the simplest thing I think for people to do is to have a field in which they can um, point to the description of the method. In other words, it would be just a, just a way for a human to uh, track down uh, uh, the details of the method. And if you had a small number of different types of surveys you were trying to harmonize, I think at the, at the person level, that's doable. If you were um, trying to analyze very big data sets, it, be, it would be very difficult for people to track down all those methods and extract information. And there you'd need some kind of machine solution. In other words, the, if, if the machine, if you have something encoded about how to do it, then you could uh, imagine machines doing the harmonizing part. But from what I've heard so far, we're more at the stage where it's going to take a small number of methods, say less than 10, in which people can critically read the details of the method and then decide what procedures are appropriate to, to harmonize the data. You mean so like how like- is, First step is just a pointer to the method. It could be a published paper. It could be uh, some kind of uh, link that's that's um, that describes the the other the only other um, place where I've seen a lot of uh, progress on method uh, compilation is uh, these uh, efforts in cell and molecular biology in notebooks where people always write down their method as they're doing a procedure. And it always seems there's small variants that they adapt for their particular situation. So there may be a level by which there's a general procedure and then there are variants. And if that's the case, maybe you can extract some common information from the general procedure at a level that will uh, be useful for detecting uh, trends in, in populations or uh, phenology or distributions, these basic variables that are important for conservation. I, I see that Anne-Sophie um, is sharing a link um, where in France they are working with a reference. Is that like a reference of protocols? Sorry, I just opened the link though. Oh yeah, catalog of methods. Oh, we can take a look at this. Thank you. Uh, are you are you there? Uh, yes. Sorry, it looks like you didn't hear me. Oh, yes, it's okay now. Oh yeah, uh, I can hear you now. Sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, indeed, it's it's a uh, it's a catalog of method and protocols, but uh, it's in French. Uh, but maybe I think it can be useful, and I send. Uh, um, I talk about this session to the to the person in charge, but uh, they were not able to join today. But they will have they will look at the review. I mean the the uh, remote uh, video and uh, try to contact them. Oh, that's perfect! Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. Great. Yeah, we'll definitely take a look at this. Any other? Any other way that you're um, reporting on your on your methods? Now, no, VJ has a a question in the oh. chat about whether the term protocol references is a uh, bibliographical citation to the method. Just to clarify, if that is the case. Yes, sorry, BJ, I, I, I skipped your, your question. Yes, yes, exactly that. The, um, the bibliographic citation of the method. So as, as Rob was thinking, so you have your the reference to the big description of the protocol, then you have like your protocol description where you put there all the differences or the particularities that your method had, and then a protocol name, which would be great if you had some sort of like control vocabulary to pick like this big categories that, that Rob was talking about, but yeah. Mm 
Can you, I think we can hear you, BJ? Yeah, yeah. So I was just saying that uh, basically the way I've been uh, reporting methods is in the in the metadata, not not in the data per se, where you have like long description, uh, descriptive paragraphs, in especially talking of uh, IPT, uh, GBIF scenario, there you basically uh, write write a couple of paragraphs on how how we have collected particular data set. But yeah, that's it. Not not really any. And and again, you cite references there if it's a, if you are following a methodology from a established uh, paper or like any book chapter or somewhere. Yeah, that's how we have been reported. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, and that's how it starts to get tricky when you're looking for specific types of, of methods, then you would need some machine or some learning approach to, to identify the correct ones. That's why we thought of this like protocol names to allow like an ESA filter uh, of, of data sets that you would be interested in. Uh, but that's the part that it's, that it's hard. Um, to start this, to start describing this like big categories of protocols. Um, Camila, hi Camila. Um, you're saying in the chat that you like Robert's uh, approach uh, from GVIF node perspective. I it's already hard enough to make publishers even the ones from ecological fields to actually document a few available protocol. Darwin the few available protocol uh, Darwin core elements. Yeah. Yeah, Camila, if you if you want to unmute yourself and Yeah, thank you. So I'm new to this group, but I'm very interested. Um, um I, I can comment on my comment. So we always try to promote from from the Colombia know the best practices and to have a Darwin core table as complete as possible. And we get really great data, very organized with very neat protocols. But then the problem is these people is is not um they don't have the time to put it to, to translate this in, in Darwin core. Sometimes they do it in the metadata as as uh, as, as you mentioned Bijar. Uh, but then when we try to explain why it is important with sampling protocol, even with the with the even core, they 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 will not do it. So we do it for them, but I know this is not the case for every node. They don't have like a help desk that will do it for them. So I think this this solution of Rover is very nice because you have like uh, in between, you will have a way to document it with like a URL, but you don't have to describe it knowing that you are already describing it in your article, in your paper, in your research submission. So I, I like it because then we have to make something that, that works for everyone that they don't going to say, oh, this is too hard, I won't do it. I mean, that's what I have seen from the people that work in this kind of fields. Thank you, Camila. That's great to know that, that some nodes are, are working on that. And, and yeah, the idea of it, it's a, the idea of this humble extension is exactly what you're saying um, to sort of like make it easier to report on this important meta that um, but but we we acknowledge that it requires some time um, and people do not really have it. Um, uh, Carlos, also, you shared a resource. Yeah, it's the same that uh, Steve asked immediately yeah. below. So if someone has used uh, protocols.io, and basically, I think we, we are sharing it because uh, it was in use by pens of publishers also. But technically, there is this, this side where you can um, deposit methods in the broad sense. So this will also work for, for protocols. And I believe that they had uh, like a, a free um, plan that maybe you could have a, as many public protocols as you wanted um and and maybe it, so in in the link that i sent which was more specific uh is uh, protocols.io help publish um and in that one well they they show that uh, the types of protocol they have and basically uh, protocols can receive a doi which is good for us in the case that, that those are really permanent and archive and always accessible um yeah, so 
And I have not been using it myself, and I don't know at, at, at this moment what is the sort of integration that Pensov has with them, or if it's still maintained, but it has been used. So this, this even if we don't use it, maybe it could be a source of structure and terms for further development of Darwin Core or for, I don't know, keeping interoperability in mind. And um, for us at Biofit, like, I mean, we're mainly working with legacy literature. So for me, what will be really interesting is to, to try the Humboldt Core in a inventory or expedition uh, publication and see how much of that publication could be structured into Humboldt Core and then publish a paper on that. Um, I'm thinking, so one of the, let's say, relatively recent but still classical inventories that I remember um, are these four volumes of the um, expeditions, the biospeleological expeditions, uh, Cuba, Romania. So, uh, Resultats des Expeditions Biospeleologique Cuban Humain a Cuba. Um, and these four volumes could be good to test Humboldt Core on, on how um, this, this, this data could be structured somehow. Um, so, there are descriptions of the samplings, there are uh, temperature measurements, there are side descriptions there are nested sampling because then there is a cave but then there is a cave entrance and the um zone where there's still light and then the dark zone and so on so there will be stations and there will be substations and then there will be collected taxa so occurrences so this this could be an opportunity to test Humboldt core on legacy literature and in general, if, if you know other publications of this kind, and especially um, publications in German, because this one that I mentioned before is mainly in French, but some other languages, so Spanish, Italian, um, English. Uh, but if, if you know surveys like this that have been published in German, then this would be really good because we are based in Germany and then we could try mapping German terms to the English terms, so maybe helping in translating the, the, the extension, um, and then also like trying it with the German literature and, and transform a publication with that. And the other thing is, as I uh, told Steve before, that uh, we also work with ontology. So some of these things uh, we could convert into an ontology if they are not an ontology already, and then, tag the actual text in publications with those ontology terms and then see how that performs in our search portal. And then we will have a practical application for legacy literature for the extension. Yeah. So I'm open to collaborations and suggestions. <laughs> that, that sounds great, Carlos. That, that sounds great. And also, um, to be honest, we're building this to make it so, and we want to make sure that it's useful. So if we start exploring that, that linking between those, those um, speleologic surveys, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but uh, with the humble, that, that's great. That, that would be a, a, great, um, a great idea. So I'm looking at time and we just go through methods. Um, does anybody else want to say something or, or should we move on to, effort, which is very related to methods. So uh, it might be it might be better to move to the effort part. <clears throat> thanks. Hey, thanks. Yanni, I, was just yeah. I was just gonna mention there are a couple questions in the chat um, that I don't think got talked about. Sorry, sorry, I'm not uh, keeping track of the chat very from, well. Uh, Sophie and Damiano. Well, my question was um, not uh, about this, uh, so I just put it in the chat. So I didn't ask to. Do I want to to shift the the discussion to something else? Uh, I don't I'm not an expert in this field, uh, and we are still collecting information from um, users in management of invasive species in our project. So I cannot uh, say so much at the moment about 
to answer to these questions. But uh, I just very in interested, so I just put some questions in the chat about terms and uh, definition of terms. So, so please go ahead. Oh, thank, thanks, thanks, Damiano, for that that explanation. Can Can anybody from from our group uh, paste the link to the to the quick hum, the quick reference guide for the humble extension? It's in the documentation. Maybe that's that's useful. I'm sorry, I would need to look for the link. So if anybody has it more accessible, that would be great. So Steve um, developed like a, a quick reference guide similar to the Darwin core one, where it's like the different classes and, and the, the name of the terms and the description. So that's an easy way to to go to go and, and read a little bit more on the on the definitions of these terms. And and then Sophie, um, could it be possible to put in place links between the Humboldt core and the sampling page? of the metadata to ease the production of data papers directly from EML. Mm. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, I think. <laughs> yes, yes, we can hear you. Thanks for yes, adding it. A small general question about the link between this extension in particular and the, the EML, uh, because from a data paper point of view, it will be really interesting to have all the protocols detailed in the data in the in the data paper, but currently with the offer writing tool, uh, Microsoft's offer writing tool, you can only uh, upload an EML file and not a data file. Um, I mean, you can upload a data file as supplementary material, but not as the skeleton of the data paper. So it would be it could be great to, to, to I don't know uh, technically how we can do this, but. Uh, Maybe a link between the Humboldt core and the, the data paper could be, could be great for uh, the reduction, reduction of the data paper. So um, you, were, you were cutting out a little bit, but if I understand you correctly, yeah, like a, a link, you, you mean like if we can put for, for, I don't know, for previously published data, if we could put a link to that EML file if you could put that in the protocols in, in Humboldt extension, is that what you're suggesting? Uh, I don't exactly know what <laughs> how it could be possible, but um, yes, yeah, so I, I was thinking about a link between the, the, the data file from the Humboldt call and the, the EML file uh, that is linked to this uh, data set uh, in order to uh, write the data paper. But I, I don't know how it's possible without also uploading the CSV from the, the occurrences and the Humboldt core. But in any way, I think it, it would be great if, if we have not only the sampling methods described in the metadata, but also the ones described in the data through the Humboldt core. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why, that's how we were thinking of things, like including this methods description in the data yeah. at, the, at the event layer uh, level. And then adding the occurrences. Well, now as an extension, but uh, with a with a new GBIF model, it will those extensions will change, but the idea it, it remains the same, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Ming, for putting the quick extension. Uh, ah, thank you for putting that link to the to the Gua Speleological Survey. Okay, so <clears throat> I think that the same question that, that I had before regarding methods, I wanted to ask a more simpler question now because it's like we are, we're only 10 minutes away and I want to get to the completeness part. But my, my key question is, are you reporting the effort, the sampling effort in some way? For instance, are you reporting, I don't know, the, the time and the, and the number of sites that you, that you visited or the number of people and the distance that you've walked through? Um, I don't know, are you, are you including that type of information in your, in your EML files or in your metadata 
or in some descriptions of your surveys? BJ says no. <laughs> Okay, interesting. Uh, I mean, un uh, unless it is part of the standard methodology, uh, I have not seen many instances where that is reported. Something like if you are, you, if we are t doing the time sampling, like in case of mm -hmm. butterflies, we have these uh, 30 minute counts. So the distance is not important there. What we do is we just count butterflies for 30 minutes in an area and basically identify species and numbers seen. In that case, it, it's part of the methodology, but otherwise suppose I'm doing a general inventory for a region and then the time varies depending on the time I have in my hand in most cases, like, okay, I'm in an area, I'm doing it for a year, hour or a couple of hours, but many times that is not uh, reported is what is my observation. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense, and it's also very much in line to what we saw in in how people are using uh, the GB, the sorry, the Darwin core term sampling effort. It's very um, varied. Like it's. Um, yeah, it's a big bag, bag of everything. Um, Sophie says that sometimes effort is, respond, is reported in the metadata section or the sampling effort field, but very few data sets have this information. Yep, yep, we've, we've seen that, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, th this is interesting. This is, this is something that we would like to incorporate and we have in fact incorporated a term in, sorry, actually two terms. Um, sampling effort protocol, value and unit. Um, but it's also, Wesley, I don't know if you want to go through this very quickly on how you are reporting on this mm -hmm. and because it could be interesting. So, well, for, <laughs> before that, I'll, I'll just sort of step back and, and and about the issue of reporting effort in the metadata versus the data themselves, um, from an end user perspective, it might be good to encourage people to do both because <laughs> you can extract, you could easily extract the effort information and model that when it's part of the data, but you can't, it's very difficult if it's in the metadata. So in the case where there is effort in the metadata, Personally, I would like to see it also in the data themselves. And regarding effort, I'm coming from a very specific place um, or one specific um, data collection scheme, eBird. Although I think I'm also speaking for, for bird survey citizen science projects more generally globally in that effort isn't a single thing. And this is one of the things that I've been wrestling with. Effort is the distance you've traveled effort is the number of observers effort is the amount of time effort could be the amount of the area in which you're you're surveying and some of these terms can some of these ideas can be wedged into the current proposal for the Humboldt extension and and Dar darwin core as well and others aren't but from the use of the data set with which i'm familiar it seems like there are going to be multiple effort variables that should somehow be encapsulated together or connected together. And they are going to be different depending on the, the projects, which is where the those three terms uh, that, that are on the top of the page come in, where for any given protocol, you're allowed to um, have a unique sampling effort or effort types and values. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've been discussing quite a lot about this. Um, but it seems that at, at least in this group, people are not 
really reporting on the effort, um, uh, which which makes sense. That that falls more in line to what we see <laughs> in the data sets more than than what it's used in in eBird or yeah the 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 the, sam the bird samplings that that require more. I mean that they are used to reporting on an effort much more. Yeah. So um, it's only five minutes away, but can we talk a little bit about completeness unless somebody has some comment about the effort? Sorry, I jumped ahead, but if nobody has any comment on the, on the effort side, if we can switch to completeness. Yes. Um, I don't have a question to um, the... I have a question about the, the um, site where it's reported. As I saw in the quick reference guide, the geospatial scope. I don't see a specific location like uh, GPS coordinates or something like that. Where would that be recorded mm -hmm. or um, linked to the data? So you could add those locations at any um, at any event layer uh, level. So you would, for instance, in the in the GB in the GB structure, you would call this Humboldt at the event core, and then you would pull in the the extension, the occurrence extension, and in there you would put the species and the occurrence. Yeah. So the lat long of the location where you've seen it. So oh. it's, it's part of the Darwin core. So ah, the, okay, the thank extension. you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Wesley. Yeah, so this is, a, yeah, exactly. That, that's worth remembering. This is like an addition to the Darwin core terms. So you could use really all the Darwin core terms as much as you want. And then this is just like adding more terms to that, uh, to that set of, to those set of terms. And we don't want to make duplicates or anything, right? That's why we, we call it an extension. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was asking because I didn't, I don't know the Darwin core terms every yeah thanks yeah yeah no makes sense makes sense and it's worth it's worth um <clears throat> reminding that anything else okay so completeness i think i would ask um uh, thank you, Camila. Yeah, we're, I think we're, and if, if many of you have to leave, you're more than welcome to join us. Maybe I should do that before everybody starts leaving because we had until, until nine. Um, if you want to be in contact with us, this is the link to, to, um, to be added to our mailing list. Um, and also we have like a GitHub repository. We are not very, good at keeping that active. Um, and then feel free to reach out to me. My email is in the website or anybody from the group. Uh, we will need to update the website because we've done a lot more than what the website says. And we will put there the links to the documentation and and all the, the latest advances. So yeah, keep, keep in touch if you're interested in these things. So one quick question, does anybody need to leave or could we stay for like 10 minutes more, let's say? You're, you're good on staying? Hey, Yanni, did you mention that we we meet regularly like every, what is it, two weeks or so? No, please, please share that, yeah. <laughs> we meet, I mean, we we meet had, every, it, yeah. It's actually this time on Wednesday mornings at whatever, your local time is when we started. Yes, exactly. We meet every week. Um, for some of us, it's Wednesday morning. For some others, it's Thursday night. And for some others, it's Wednesday afternoon <laughs> or something like that. So um, yeah, join us. Um, it's a very nice group of people. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, so some people are leaving. Um, okay, great. Some some of them are already joining. Carlos, do you have a comment? I don't know. Do you have to leave also? <clears throat> He's not there right now. It happens. I can stay. So um sorry, I'm trying to read your your comment. It happens that effort is sometimes underreported because the sampling method just needs to get done, regardless of how much time and people it requires. Example 25 particles, one meter, or all the leaf litter, woods, rocks, and surface of solids examined. In those cases, recording of effort is secondary or irrelevant to the results and more interesting for survey planning and budgeting. That's a good point. Um, Oh boy, a BJ, 5 a.m. Where are you? <laughs> I'm I'm based in LA now, so that's 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 all right. I'll I'll make it for some meetings, if not all. That's great. And you can you can receive the emails. <laughs> um, that's a good point, Carlos, about the about not being the focus of the survey and and how that can lead to like not even reporting on it or not even considering uh, as part of the of the reporting um bye rob see you next week um okay so with the people that are still um present um Maybe we can talk very briefly on completeness, and and then of course we we can keep this conversation on a on a different um, arena. Um, so completeness right now, the terms that are right now created with a quick reference guide, and it, and that it's already in the in the test IPT in GBIF, focuses on your interpretation of how that survey is complete or not. So how, how many, how, how complete the survey is based on your targeted list of species. That is how currently it's um, described. And it's not so much about if you are reporting all the species that you, that you saw or, or registered, and or and or your living sum of it. Is that difference clear? Or maybe Wesley, can you help me with this? Yeah. So there are okay, there are two, or the way I, I think about it is there are effectively two types of completeness. One of them is the one with the terms uh, as already described, where it's have you is this a thorough reporting of every species that could possibly have been there? But there is another parallel sort of completeness in the reporting. Um, the, the case, again, I'm going back to eBird, and I'm familiar with, there are some data submissions where somebody has gone out and seen a rare species and they're only interested in reporting that rare species. And they might have been in a, an area with tens or hundreds of other species, but they want to report that one species. In that case, you know that it, it's it's important, we feel from, from the eBird data perspective, to know that you cannot infer that other species were not present because the reporting was incomplete. Whereas if you were went to see uh, this same rare species, but you also recorded all of the other species that you had seen at the same time, that would be completeness of reporting of the species identified within the taxonomic group that, that's been identified for a protocol. So the reporting completeness, the knowledge of that is needed to infer whether you could, or, to, to know whether you can infer absences of species or non-detections of species. And then from those data where you can infer the non-detections, you could probably then continue on to talk about completeness of surveying or sort of complete representation of the species that are potentially there or how, how close you came. So I, I see them as two complementary things. It is 
Is there any question about that? And for some protocols, this may or may not be as relevant, but I think it's more re generally relevant than people might think. So that if you go on, for example, a museum collection expedition, you might be targeting collection of specimens of particular species for collection so that the collection expedition then is not a complete reporting of the species that for, for birds, for example, were caught in mist nets. Maybe you just remove the ones that you were not interested in, in adding to your collection. So the concept I think is more general than just what I'm talking about with eBird, but it's just that we tend to use it specifically to infer the non-detections of species not on lists. So uh, does that mean we are not, I mean, we are discouraging use of the computed completeness like Chow index or something here, or that also could be a possibility? That's the, I, I, as I understand it, that is the current intent of these terms, the, the terms that already exist in the proposal for the Humboldt extension. And it's going to vary from person to person, pro, data set to data set, how the completeness is inferred. But hopefully there are enough raw data provided that somebody could, if they don't like your assessment of completeness, they can redo it for themselves. Yeah, exactly. This would be, for instance, I don't know, I'm, more, I'm very familiar with like rarefaction curves or like species accumulation curves. If you have done such, such an analysis, you can report it here, but that would be at the, <clears throat> At the at the interpret the final interpretation of completeness, and not exactly what Wesley was referring to, as if you are reporting the complete species, um, the, the complete list of species that you saw, or somehow and, detected. Exactly. So we were thinking if maybe we could add another term that refers to that type of reporting completeness. How how do you how does eBird refer to? Um, uh, is checklist complete or something like that? Effectively, it's a Boolean variable. A yes, no. Is the checklist a report of all species that you observed and identified? Yes or no. And it's a required field for submission of data. Something like that. Uh, we, we just call it checkness complete, but in the case uh, of the Humboldt extension, the concept of reporting completeness somehow should probably be in, in the term itself and not just in the definition. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We need to figure out a good term for this. Uh, actually, yeah, thinking about it now, taxon completeness reported makes makes a makes sense that it is not a computed value, but it's just what the, uh, the researcher yeah. is is reporting. And I'm sure if I read the complete definition, it will it will be much more clear. Maybe I just like <laughs> jumped up on my question. No, you're I think you're right, BJ. I think you're right. This this name of the term <laughs> It sounds more related to what Wesley is describing that to our intent of completeness. I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, I was wondering, are is any of you have these sorts of ideas in mind when you're when you're in the field or where you when you're designing your your surveys? or when you're ingesting the data, right? Maybe not. Not so much. Ming, in the in the case of like, sorry <laughs> to put you in the in, on the spot. In the case of like this trawling surveys, um, 
you sort of like assess, no? How, what, what would you be reporting on the, on the, those captured specimens? Yes, there are a number of species and life stage that's being targeted. Hmm. Um, but that was it. I'm not sure how the other, the other bycatch were being treated. Yeah, exactly. You call that bycatch, right? Yeah. Extra things. Yeah. Um, yeah, but but you're right. I think we've we've discussed this and we've included that in the scope, like in the taxonomic scope when you when you're targeting certain groups. Yeah. So the the gear, the sampling design has an explicit uh, explicit mention the target and the excluded uh, target. Te yeah. excluded taxonomic scope and target taxonomic scope. Um, but I'm not sure if there are some bycatch that's caught but not recorded or caught not identified. And I'm not sure about those. I have seen in, in marine uh, bycatches, uh, like the researcher um, processes a certain group and at times remaining specimens are just kept in another big jar unsorted and then if someone wants to open that jar and sort them out later for their interest can be done. It's, it's pretty frequently seen now that I'm working with actually marine <laughs> data I have been uh, learning yeah. about it over last few weeks, I should say. And that, that it seems to be a common common thing to do like I'm interested in these one or two groups I extract and then remaining things just are kept in a in a big jar and then someone else comes and picks up what they want from there and at times those go to different uh, uh, museums ah, someone just picks up and takes to their museum and say oh I'm going to curate these there and basically carry them at any time yeah. Damiano Dam had a question. Yeah. yeah, well, I have actually wanted to say about the, the bycatch also. Um, it's quite important uh, when you speak about invasive species and you have trying to manage it. Yes. So bycatch is definitely important. I think uh, it should be not considered in taxonomic scope because indeed it's a bycatch. It's just out of a taxonomic scope. So I would, in my idea, ideally, I would put it uh, as casual observations because uh, it's not something or I don't know I don't know really as now I have a solution about that but I don't see that should be in the taxonomy scope of inventory because you don't know what you get <laughs> as a bycatch um, no my question was about the taxonomy scope of inventory uh, here what do you suggest uh, if you, let's say that you don't have to exclude something out of some genes, genera, for example, wouldn't be better to just reference to publish the list as a checklist uh, in Checklist Bank or in GBIF and uh, mention it so that uh, you consider the taxonomy scope like a, a reference to a published checklist on GBIF. So you split uh, the, you know, to manually list uh, species name in the events, but uh, you put it in the, like, like a link to a DOI, to a checklist that you maintain separately. That, that's a very interesting, thanks for pointing that out. That's a very interesting link um, to put us a scope currently, right now, what it's suggested to include there is like some sort of higher taxa. Let's say if you're working on a, a particular type of birds, you would just put aves there, like a, at a higher taxa level to, to include all. And then just in the excluded one, I don't know, include some families or some orders that, that you did not collect. Uh, or if they have a specific size or a specific um, activity like diurnal or nocturnal um, activity patterns, you would specify it in the in the excluded. But we we had multiple conversations about how to put the 
the targeted ones, right? Like it could be a like a very long list of of groups um, or even like species lists. So it makes sense to link it to a, an already reported checklist on of the area. Um, and I think that's similar to how Ebert works, right? Like you have a expected species, uh, sorry, expected list of species in that area. You are, people can report anything with eBird. It's just that their people are provided with the list of expected species on data entry, but you can actually add to that, say, if you find a, a rare species. So, um, it, it, yeah, it's it's I'm quite a bit easier with birds where we just say any bird is allowed because the other option is to list over 10,000 taxa. And that list would then have to be updated with every update to taxonomy because new species are being described or split every single year. So that, that's sort of why we, we went back to just saying, is this a report of all the species or list of all of the species you reported or not. And we just, it's, with eBird, it's implicit that it's birds, but for moving the data into the GBIF, a Humboldt extension database, we would need to specify that it's all wild birds. So uh, all aves, non-domestic. Yeah. If but that is a very interesting. That is a very interesting way of seeing uh, this taxonomic scope and allowing that link to 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 the to other sources where the those expected lists were already published. I think that's a good that's a good idea. Um, thanks, Damiano, for that. It's just something that uh, we did just without using inventories and something like that, but uh, sometimes for us was convenient to have a list of species on GBIF so that we can mention it. And that was just the trigger in my, my head about that. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if it's it would be easy enough to include that in the description of the terms that you could link to already published data. If, if some switch like that could be like very easily um, implemented, but that's a good point. Uh, recently, I had a discussion with a group which is uh, looking for a set of invasive species. So anyone who is surveying is looking for a set of 25 invasive plant species in the region. And they were also kind of unsure how do they report, like suppose someone records out of 25, eight present which also means that the remaining ones are absent because these people are particularly looking okay. for each of those. So the, the question and the discussion was, how do we uh, report these absences and on, on, on GBF itself so that they, they can be like used by uh, people who are actually looking for uh, certain uh, trends in the data. So I don't know if this suggestion of actually adding this list and then saying, okay, out of these, we did. So the effort is 100%, the list is of these 25 species and only these tens were reported, which means 15, 15 were absent, something of yeah. that sort. Or maybe for every time they can explicitly publish it as absent. That that could be another option. Yeah, yeah. Exactly for those type of, of inventories, we decided to include um, the absent data. Mm -hmm. So if you are reporting on absences, uh, which is that kind of information is key for multiple like global indicators or like <clears throat> that's saying, yeah, invasiveness. Well, that's a huge thing. Um, yeah, so we are including those absent data and we have another term to, to add if you are in fact reporting absences or not. Yeah, but, but yeah, you're right. The 25 species might be easier to fit in one, in one uh, 
uh, cell, but if you have like a hundred species, it might be easier to just put a link to a checklist. I agree. I agree. Cool. This is super interesting. Okay, thank you so much for staying. I don't know if somebody else wants to add something. We are way past our time. I really appreciate everybody staying. Yeah, I have another question uh, to yeah, what EJ just uh, said um, with the absence reported. Um, I'm yeah. also very interested in uh, invasive species. And you just said that it would be easier to link to a checklist instead of a cell with hundreds of of species or, or um, how is this technically done? Is is there, so, I mean, you could put in a cell like a hundred or a hundred thousand IDs, which uh, which are being used in GBIF for, for every uh, species that I understand. Um, but how does this checklist system work? So th there's a link to a checklist and is the checklist then comprised of like in this case present species or not present species can you please explain a little bit did you understand no, yeah, what yeah no, th uh, no thanks for your question no this was just like ideas that we that we started okay. discussing here no mm -hmm. currently that field the the target taxonomic scope in there you would put the way that it's currently developed is that you would put the list of species or taxa that you're targeting. There's no link to any checklist or any GBFID or anything. There's, there's no link there right now. It's just a text field. What we were discussing oh, okay. is that it would, be, it would be interesting to add that functionality, to be able to add here a link to a published checklist or a GBF, um, um, data set with the checklist or some other link to somewhere where the, the long list of species has already been detailed. But this was just an idea that we started discussing right now. I don't even know how that could be implemented. Yeah, and, and also okay. it's important to think, remember that this is a definition and not an implementation. Implementation is somewhat a separate issue than defining the terms or the exact implementation at least. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, what I was thinking was like, you, you definitely can publish a GBF data set, which is just checklist, right? So you publish that and then you basically provide that data set ID in, in the place where you are saying where you're submitting a species list. It could be a actual species list or it could be a link to that species list, which is actually the GBF data set ID. So GBF can internally link the two and the researcher who's trying to do it say okay this is my master list and these are the ones that i found so in 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 that sense uh, uh compute which are actually absent that was how i was visualizing it but as as uh Chani just said that it's basically still a concept we need to work out and try out with a few cases and Okay, I was just thinking if you have a list of names um, that could be somehow problematic uh, because of the splits and lumps and uh, name changes and whatever could happen. Um, so I'm not sure if this would be better because no, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, if it, it can it can have uh, pros and cons, I guess if you have the date and the exact taxonomic concept that lies behind those names, then it might be more information and better information. But uh, it could also be misleading if you have the, the names as a, as a um, string and not have the IDs uh, to really uh, point to the taxon concept. Although I'm still not completely familiar with all the taxon concepts and um, it's still very overwhelming with, with lumps and um, splits and uh, homonyms, I don't know. Um, it's just something uh, I wanted to say to consider the pros and cons before implementation of any of this. Although I don't have a solution <laughs> for it. Yeah, no, I think Martin, you, 
um, you address it very well, like it would be great to link it to a taxon concept, but I don't think there's, the development is even there to link it to a taxon concept. Yeah. Um, there's no, uh, in Tad Week, there's been a couple of very interesting conversations about um, ass assigning IDs to a, to, to a taxon concept or, in, but it's just like so hard and there's no current platform or current organization that has been able to do that. So those lumps and, and, and merges are very hard. Um, I just was part of a publication very recently that, I don't know, suggests or explores a way of um, including taxonomic data in your, in your database, which would be like, not only including the name, but also the authorship, the year, and some more information on the spatial um, distribution of that species. Yeah, but even with that uh, review that we did, we got a lot of different ideas and a lot of different applications and implementations out there. So I don't think we're ready <laughs> for, for, that, for that kind of, or of this, or starting even on, on that implementation, but that's a very valid point. Very bad. I, I thought GBIF was exactly yeah, doing this. So, so GBIF is, is working on a, on a, sorry, sorry, Car Carlos, you were, I, I heard something. I think I interrupted. Was from, yeah, from sorry. Is, so, someone else is uh, talking here also, but uh, I just wanted to say that uh, for methodology description and terms like voucher institutions, um, that is, it's good that we check um, what is going on on the GR side, so the, this global register of scientific collections, because they are already recording data fields from IDIC Bio and the other um, registries who have joined. So um, let's see what they are using, and then maybe terms like voucher institutions will end up being something else or we will just have to map them to a term that is already in use in the year SI. Uh, I think has vouchers is okay because it will be just yes or no, maybe. Um, but, but maybe voucher institution, we will have to turn it into something else or just clarify that is equivalent to or is exact synonym of, um, that's it. But just so that it's, mm, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Very back, good. back to taxonomy quickly. Uh, yeah, Martin, uh, my understanding is the same as yours, at least for birds, there is an attempt to come up with a standardized taxonomic list of taxonomic concepts for birds. It was somewhere, I thought it was within Tadwig somewhere already, but uh, even with that, things are fluid enough that for the data from eBird, when they are when the sort of the limited subset of fields is pushed into GBIF now, we actually repeat the entire process every single year. We back out all the old data, we dump in an entirely new set of replacement data after there's after taxonomic adjustments and also some um, after we have backfilling of data from old years, we have review of records, new records appearing as valid data, others being removed. But it's, it's maintenance is, I think no matter what you do is, is going to be an issue. There just doesn't seem to be any way around it that I think we've come up with. You're mute, Yanni. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, these are these are very valid points. This taxonomies and taxon concepts. It's just a hard, a hard thing. And and in humble extension, we we're not. <laughs> our scope is not. It's not there. <laughs> um. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for even staying longer. I hope this was useful. At least for me, it was. Um, there's definitely very interesting conversations to have. So if you want to join our 
our meeting groups. So I'll, I'll put it in the in the slide again. Um, hopefully, and like Steve put it the other day, uh, we feel this work is advanced enough to start um, <clears throat> the the Tadwick process on on uh, how do you call it like ratifying this as an extension, but. But afterwards, based on the discussions, it's very, it will be almost mandatory that we revise some of the terms and we include more. So every conversation that we have now, it's, it's, it's very useful to have, even, even if we start implementing this as it is, um, later on we can add more terms. So thank you so much for for getting involved and for speaking up and, and muting and, and everything. I know, I know sometimes. Yeah. Nina? yeah. Sorry, I have a small question about uh, the, to participate to the two, the weekly uh, meeting groups. Um, are you subscribed to the mailing list? Um, is that enough uh, to get um, Zoom links for the, mm -hmm. um, your weekly meetings? So yeah, so it should be enough. I will get, so team uh, Robin, Robinson from GBIF is the one that manages the mailing list. So I'll ask him to, to make sure that everybody's getting those emails. So the people that are subscribing, but uh, for now, if you can send me your email, I'll just add yeah. you to the, to the weekly, to the weekly email that I send with, with the Zoom link and everything. Okay. And, and there's, I have seem to have a calendar invitation that came from somewhere. Did you send those out? Yeah. That's how I remember. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can do that again with like more people so that, that at least that meeting is in the calendar and then you decide if you want to join or not. Yeah, that, that might be That's, easy. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's also because uh, Lina Reiserhoven, my colleague, is not here. So I will probably, she will be um, participating more than me to this uh, so i'm collecting information for her oh that's great that's great yeah so uh, feel free to put your email in the chat and and i can add yeah. you to, to that invite great <clears throat> something else something that i forgot um steve ming wesley i don't know something else all good all good for me. Oh, Zach! I just saw that Zach was there. That's great. I hope he can he could um, listen to the discussions a little bit. Hey, <laughs> sorry to put to put you in the, on the spot. Zach is also a, a very active member of our of our groups meetings. Um. Well, great. It uh, this was a, a great conversation, and I hope to. Yeah, to keep being in touch with you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for staying longer. Mm -hmm.